Hi, I'm John Atak, um, and I'm here to talk with uh, Joe Zimhartz about his wonderful new book, uh, Santa Fe, Bill Tate and Me, How an Artist Became a Cult Interventionist. And uh, I just finished reading it. I enjoyed it. I, I thought it was well written um, and quite fascinating. I mean, a small part of it because I, too, trained as an artist and it, it's in my background. But um, you penetrated a, a group of the I am movement, a whole group of um, sort of bastard children of, of theosophy. And, yeah. and it, for me, that's, that's been very interesting because, you know, I, I don't know that much about it. So um, why don't you start by telling us about, about your background, you know, your, your fine arts degree and how you ended up in Santa Fe um, in the first place. Okay. Yeah, well, I'm, I'll be 73 this year, so that dates me a bit here. Um, I went to college in the late 1960s at the University of Dayton in Ohio, and I started out as an engineering major, and I was doing okay. Something, you know, in me that wanted to be an artist since I was young took over because they had an art department. It was, it was a poor art department. It just started, and uh, mm -hmm. I switched majors, much to the chagrin of my father and mother, into a world that was doomed to failure, right? <laughs> yep, I know the same. So, yep. but, but this um, was a period of time in the late 60s where there was a lot of cultural ferment. And, you know, I began experimenting with like psychedelic drugs. I took an LSD trip for the first time in 1967. And, um, you know, I, I got caught up a bit in that, not, not without some skepticism, but I, I was a moderate participant in the hippie generation. Yeah, me too. So, so I, I finished there. I, I worked for a few years, about two years, in a large institution that that uh, treated uh, what they used to call mentally retarded or brain damaged people, people mm -hmm. that are intellectually deficient. Yep. And it was the old asylum type thing that they were beginning to empty out. And I took the job to save money to go to art school, a proper art school, the Pennsylvania Academy in Philly, Philadelphia. And uh, but I. I was, was uh, I was introduced to a whole segment of society I hadn't paid much attention to were these people that were under 70 IQ and brain damaged in many ways. And I was uh, there to help with uh, supervising a, what they called a, a sheltered workshop program to test the residents to see if they were capable of putting together screws and nuts and bolts in a certain way in order to make money in these sheltered workshops once they got out of the asylum. Yeah. You know, so I was part of this testing program and I was trained to do that there. I went to the Pennsylvania Academy afterwards and, and uh, uh, left there in 1975. They awarded me a certificate after three years uh, of completion. I went to Santa Fe, New Mexico because I heard it was a large art town. Uh, with about 200 art galleries, the third largest art market in the United States at the time. Yeah. So, and, and also I had a knack for being able to do portraits very quickly. And they had a plaza there where I knew I could work during the summertime if I got a license. And, and I did. I worked there for 14 years, about four to five months out of the year and generated quite a bit of my income sketching heads. Yeah. Um, and I exhibited in galleries and I taught life drawing at a community college at a regular college there also and i also taught for a year at the uh new mexico state penitentiary mm -hmm. uh two college uh drawing courses there and uh so you know i had my feet in the art world quite a bit but at the same time i had this yearning to find what i would call a hero system what mm -hmm. otto rank would call a hero system yeah something that would guide me you know, and, and there was no where in the arts that, that I felt real comfortable with at this point. I mean, some of the abstract artists appealed to me, but not completely. I, I liked illustrating. I, I like to be able to draw real things, you know, th that we see. So I came across this magazine with uh, an article about the artist Nicholas Rorich in it. And it was an American artist magazine and it featured his painting on the cover. And, and I read it and he was a mystic, a follower of theosophy, started his own branch of theosophy with his wife, Helena Rorich. They were both Russian. And um, 
they called it Agni Yoga and naming it Agni after the God in India, the God of wisdom, the God of fire, the, the God of transformation. And so they uh, were quite successful starting the society in the 1920s. And I, they, they developed a large following uh, in New York and in Paris and, and also in Russia. I mean, today there's about 3 million Russians that are devotees of Agni Yoga. So it's one of the larger, more successful theosophical offshoots. Um, Rorich was uh, quite adept at illustrating mountains like the Himalaya and saints. He would do pictures of people like Melarepa and St. Francis and all of this stuff. And, and uh, you know, this was new to me and it intrigued me. Mm -hmm. I also read mainly P. Hall's book, The Secret Teachings of All Ages, about Hermeticism and Rosicrucianism and Freemasonry. Blavatsky was included in there. And that introduced me to this character called Saint Germain because he dedicated the book to this Prince Rakosti, Saint Germain character that he, he said. Now he, mainly P. Hall was a theosophist and he claimed that the, um, the Shakespeare things were written by Francis Bacon and he had evidence for it in his writing and it sounded pretty compelling to me at the time. I mean, what the hell did I know? And so at that same time, within the same month period, I was introduced to the I am activity, which was also in Santa Fe. And it was called the St. Germain Foundation. And I began to read their books. You know, I met an old woman that was part of the group. So I'm getting swept up in this stuff um, privately. Uh, my first wife moved out with me to Santa Fe and, and we uh, had a child. Uh, we got divorced when, in 1979 when my daughter Nadia was two years old. After I had gotten caught up in this group called Church Universal and Triumphant, which claimed to combine the Agni Yoga teachings at their highest level with the I Am teachings, the St. Germain Foundation. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, so I, I, I explored that and uh, I talk about that era of my life in the book. What, what um, sort of practices did, did you do? What, what was the activity involved with the St. Germain Foundation with the I Am movement? Right. Yoga? Yeah, th there, there was a lot of reading and, and, and all of that and a lot of flowery stuff from Ascended Masters about changing the world and changing yourself and creating a perfect mind and, and, and a lot, a lot of it borrowed from new thought religion in the 19th century, along with theosophy, but their, their primary uh, weapon, if you will, for healing and changing the world was something called decreeing yeah. and the, the Easterners would call mantra yoga. Yeah. And it's a way of repeating phrases and, and uh, these concoctions of prayers very rapidly it's also taken from the new thought idea of affirmations, yeah. repeating affirmations, like the one that was popular in the early 20th century in every way. And in every way I'm getting better and better and better, mm. you know, that that was millions were reciting that around Europe and the United States back around 1910. August so Napoleon Hill and various people. Napoleon Hill came out of that tradition. That's correct. A Frenchman named Couillet, his last name was, was the one that developed that mantra. Yeah. So um, uh, the, the decreeing thing was something I wanted to learn because it was like a tool mm -hmm. to open up this inner world and to change the world magic using magic words. And I approached the I am people and they said that I couldn't decree with them because I had revealed that I was had, had experimented with drugs. And they said that I had a hole in my aura in this lifetime and I would have to wait for another lifetime in order to approach their high teachings, you know? So, all right, well, I kind of gave up on that I am thing. And I kept reading the Agni Yoga books. I, when I were, whenever I passed through New York City, which is about once or twice a year, I'd stop into the Agni Yoga Society at the, at the Rorich Museum at 107th and Riverside. And, and I got to know the director, Sina Fosnik there, and we would exchange letters. I never joined the Agni Yoga Society. I was just sort of a armchair Agni Yoga person, you know, at the time. Yep. The decreeing thing was interesting to me. Uh, friends of mine had been in the Church Universal and Triumphant. They found out, unknown to me, by the way, they found out that I had been involved with Agni Yoga and 
read the I am stuff and they invited me to, to one of their meetings in Albuquerque. And they gave me this book, The Chila and the Path, which claimed that their group combined the I am with Agni Yoga. And I thought, hell, I'm already in. <laughs> you know, so I started going to conferences there. And by the third conference, I started to sour on the whole thing because I saw too many conflicts. For instance, Agni Yoga embraced kind of a communist socialist idea of the world. The I am was vociferously fascist, very authoritarian and anti-communist, anti-liberal, mm. you know, and yet this group, the Church Universal, is trying to combine the two somehow. Yet the Church Universal was also very right wing, mm. uh, very anti-liberal, chanted against Democrats and anybody they didn't like, um, uh, using these decrees, mm. you know, so you could use decrees to spread love, and healing and protection, and you could use the decrees to destroy your enemies. Mm. You know, it's 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 kind of like sorcery or 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 witchcraft or whatever you want to call that stuff. Absolutely. Or what I call the awe culture. You know, yeah. there's people that believe in the powers of the mind and the sixth sense and all this. It's it's pervasive throughout society. It is. Um, Harry Potter. It's all full of the awe culture, right? <laughs> so. Uh, Star Wars, you know, Star Trek, it's all full of our culture. It's, it's, it's all about that stuff, mm -hmm. Very along much. with science. Yeah. yeah. So that, that, um, that's a brief synopsis of, of my journey. And I, I started to question this stuff and got out of it and uh, then began inadvertently helping people that were in my group to leave. Mm -hmm. And that started me on this journey of, of more research, because as they asked me questions, I started looking up answers. You know, even after I got them out, I wanted to know more. I know the feeling. Yeah, it's, it's almost a disease. <laughs> and uh, the, um, I met my second wife around 1984. Well, I had already known her because we met after I took this trip to India and, and uh, around the world in 1981. Mm -hmm. But in 1984, we began to date and we got married in 1985. And I wanted to put all this cult stuff behind me because it really just absorbed my, my, my life. And, and, and I had dozens of books, hundreds of books, you know, that I purchased. I was wasting money, time. I was struggling as an artist. I was working as a construction guy. I had a, I had a pickup truck and I did handyman work. Yeah. So I was getting by. So I made the mistake of, of going to a conference in Santa Fe on a cult and the occult put on by some Christians that wanted to help people in the area that were having problems with all this stuff. And I went to the, just out of curiosity, it was in 1985 and, and the speakers were interesting. They had a Christian slant to their, 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 uh, their talks. There was one guy there, a Christian that, that uh, Morton Kelsey that followed the Carl Jung's ideas of what spirituality was about. And he talked about that. But I kept putting up my hand, you know, and, and asking questions and correcting things they were saying about new age groups. And, you know, no, Rudolf Steiner did not teach that. He was more, you know, that kind of thing. I was I was saying all this stuff. And they were in the, the people that put the conference on wanted to start an organization, which they called the Center for Christian Information, as a helping place for people to come to, no matter what religion they were from, to get information, to help them out of the miasma of, of, of issues with the new age, with cults and, and all of that. And they asked me if I would come to their first meeting. I missed the meeting. They called me up after the meeting and they wanted to know if I would be the chairman of yeah, their yeah. organization. <laughs> so I accepted and I was the chairman for seven years. And that experience got me involved in then researching the Cult Awareness Network I had met Margaret Singer in 1982 and she asked me to go, but I refused, I just didn't go for three years. And finally I said, okay, I'll go to a cult awareness network. And I met people like Steve Hassan, um, Patrick Ryan, uh, you know, I met him one of those, uh, and other people that are considered deprogrammers, you know, which did it the illegal way that would come to those conferences. All those people that, that were involved in exit counseling began to call me when they had these new age cases. Could you come and help? You know, so I started doing that, not thinking it was going to become a career, but I got swept up in that, too. And for 
almost 14 years running, I was doing cases all around the world with people. And sometimes I would get into trouble. I got sued once by a major martial arts cult and I got um, arrested and then charged with um, kidnapping on one case in 1991. And I stood trial in 1993 and got acquitted up in Idaho. And it costs a lot of money to get through that mess, you know, so. Yep, I do know. And, and when I got sued, I, we actually won the case, but it still costs a lot of money to pay the lawyers, correct? Yeah. For sure. And, and even Scientology then was trying to get their hooks into me. Uh, uh, Kent Moxon, their lawyer, subpoenaed me to do a discovery thing for a whole day. I, I had to sit there and be um, questioned by. A, a deposition. It was a deposition. I, I, I had, had to go through two, that twice. I had, I had two days of deposition with Kendrick Moxon way back. Lovely. Oh, well, God bless you. <laughs> he's also, it's worth pointing out, he's one of the 38 unindicted co-conspirators in the case that put Mary Sue Hubbard and 10 other Scientologists in prison. So he, he was on the list. Interesting. You know, he, he, um, he was interesting to meet him because I kind of knew about him already. So just as a joke, I called a friend of mine, uh, Joe Flanagan, who was a lawyer. And he's an ex-Scientologist, and he used to do exit counseling with, you know, helping Scientologists out. And uh, they, they knew of him. And so by surprise, I brought Joe with me to the deposition. <laughs> he didn't charge me anything, but we sat there together as, you know, and well, had a bit of fun with Moxon. Curiously, but, curiously when, when I did a depot with him, I took Richard Woods with me. Ah. This massive six-foot-four guy. And I said... Richard, could you just sit on the edge of his eye line throughout the deposition? So Moxon kept looking over at this huge guy glowering at him. It, it was, uh, we had fun. I must say that because he did it in England, uh, we had to have a barrister, a lawyer, who would yeah. act the part of a judge. And the second day, as I was walking along the cor corridor next to this guy, he turned to me and he quietly said, they're awful people, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> so that's the impression that Moxon had made on him, you know. Yeah, you know, he was smooth and, and he had some evidence that I had supported the Call to Awareness Network. What they were trying to show is that I was giving the, the, the Call to Awareness Network kickbacks, yeah. for giving me cases I would pay them for, you know, which I never did. Yeah. You know, I basically donated some money to help with their ex-member fund to help ex-members come on scholarship to the, mm -hmm. to the conferences. And I might have done that twice, but, but they claim that was evidence. This is about the time they were suing the Cult Awareness Network and putting them out of business and they were gathering evidence. And I was part of that. that I worked, that was what we done. Dan Leopold, I think was working on that at that time was one of the lawyers. Yeah. But there were 54 cases brought under Mox by Moxon against, you know, by various people and 53 of them, we won. Yeah. But then we lost one and that's where it went. I know. But but so I was in the mix, you know, of all of that stuff in, in the Cult Awareness Network. And, and now I, I work quite a bit with International Cultic Studies Association, you know, not on their board, but just as a supportive person doing talks and book reviews and whatever little bit I can do to help. Yeah. Um, you know, as you know, there's not there's no money in, in a lot of work in this field. And, and, you know, unless you get paid for a lecture now and then you know, or you do a consultation with a family that's willing to pay you for, for whatever services you're giving. Mm. You know, other than that, it's a struggle to make a living at, at anything to do with the cult business. I mean, I had something like a 50 to 1 ratio of people who paid me nothing, people who paid me something. Fit for, so for everybody I saw that could pay me, there'd be 50 other people that couldn't. You know, they'd yeah. come away from the group and they needed help. And yeah. as you say, that. Even somebody like Lawrence Wallersheim, who, who received $9.2 million, mm. and they had to pay him, having marched up and down the streets, going not one thin dime for Wallersheim, they had to pay him, and it wasn't in thin dimes. Though we did think it might come in the form of $9.2 million in dimes. There you go. But most of that money went straight to the lawyers, and it took him yeah. 20 years to get to that. And, you know, it, that money is now spent. Lawrence has to work for a living. Um, in his you know, that, that um, the legal system in the United States, you know, is a, very, is a little bit different than Australia and England. And, and it's, it's it very bipolar. I mean, it, it's yeah. and, and very manipulative mm -hmm. in many ways. I mean, the lawyers can, can bend the minds of the jury in all sorts of ways if they want to. 
And um, it really takes a lot of effort to, to get justice. You know, as, as my lawyer told me during my, the, the trial that I went on, he said, you know, I want you to do three things, Joe, tell the truth, tell the truth and tell the truth. And then he said, uh, the court is not going to guarantee justice. All it does is guarantee a hearing. You know, so that kind of woke me up to what what basically was going on. Yeah, I mean, it, it, the courts close a matter. They, they, it's not they're not fair. It's not just, but they mm -hmm. finish it, and it, yeah. it, it it has become so incredible. You know, the fact that it took Wallersheim twenty years along the mm -hmm. way. Uh, I think the first slap suit, strategic lawsuits against public participation in California, was won by Lawrence when you finally got this way of saying, look, this massive organization with billions of dollars is trying to destroy me. And you can go into court for a day and say, this is why they shouldn't be allowed to. And uh, yeah, that, that was good. But in the US, you don't have costs in cause. You, don't, you, you actually have no. to counter sue to, to get your lawyers paid, at least in the Commonwealth and uh, English systems. You, the costs are bound up so that you can theoretically get the money back. But again, if they can keep you in court for 20 years, then you're not going to find a lawyer on contingency. You are going to have to pay somebody, which was... Yeah. You know, I had a single hearing where um, bar their barrister charged £16,250, which is about $20,000 for half an hour of his time. He went on to become the Dean of All Souls College, which is the head of the largest college at Oxford University the next year. So uh, I question the morality, not only of the legal system, but also of the academic system, that such people yeah. are able to profit in such a way. But so it goes. Um, yeah, so it goes. You know, power is very uh, addictive. So Yeah, and, and tends uh, to corrupt and absolute power, absolutely so. Yeah. Okay, so um, I think we've, I think you've, very succinctly covered a lot of ground actually Bar barged into a lot of territory yeah uh, yeah the the uh one thing i wanted to say is that you know af after the leader dies and you've experienced this with hubbard but but elizabeth prophet passed away the, the group's dynamism kind of uh you don't hear anything about church universal and triumphant in fact they don't even use the name anymore mm -hmm. they went back or reverted back to their original name, Summit Lighthouse, because it's not as charged with the history that Church Universal had with its bomb shelters and, and uh, the lawsuits and the court things and, and you know, the, the corruption that was in the movement was exposed quite a bit, not only by me, but quite a few other ex-members. Hmm. So uh, they've settled down into becoming Summit Lighthouse and they still function. They have, I think, more members in South America than they do in the United States now. Hmm because they translated everything into Spanish. Uh, unlike Scientology, which still remains kind of in your face, dynamic with another ruthless leader. You know, mm. that's, I think that's the key here. Church Universal did not come up with another leader. They have a committee running the whole thing, much like the old I Am group has gone into obscurity basically after their major court case in the 1940s, when they were sued for 19 counts of fraud by the federal government. And we're not allowed to use the US mails again until the mid 1950s to, to mm -hmm. disseminate their literature. Um, they've become more paranoid and secretive and they don't hear much about the I am movement. Uh, it, it's it, even though you can buy their books and all of that in new age bookstores. But, you know, so, so there is a difference when, when a group doesn't have a dynamic leader to take over for instance christianity needed a saint paul uh mormonism needed a brigham young yeah they also would have died away probably yeah brigham yeah. young was the person who, who sprang to mind for me and and you can't imagine the latter-day saints the mormon movement continuing without such a figure and a really vicious um determined man in very much way that, the same way that david miscavige is with with scientology mm -hmm. that yeah and I mean, his background is extraordinarily strange that he grew up a Scientologist, that yeah. his father, Ron Miscavige, who of course has defected and written a book about his own son. Yes, I read it. Um, that, and, and who at the time he wrote the book still believed in Scientology, but not the mother cult, not the Church of Scientology. So you've got this peculiar idea that a publisher who'd published two 
uh, critiques of Scientology, then picks up uh, Ron Miscavige's book and it's got recommended reading at the end, which are Hubbard books. I'm told that he's changed his mind since then, having had a bit of time to think about it. Uh. But David Miscavige was, is an asthmatic, quite severely so. Um, he had a lot of steroid treatment as a teenager, which I think, you know, will have a developmentally that has to have an effect. It has to have an effect physically and on the brain. Um, he's an asthmatic, but he's a smoker, which is it was the same with Hubbard. You know, you see them with their inhaler in one hand and their camel in the other. Um, some contradiction there. But the ruthlessness, I mean, the first the first thing that that scared me and made me back away from Scientology was this announcement that there'd been this mission holders conference. And this man, David Miscavige, who we'd never heard of, had suddenly asserted that we were now going to be tough and ruthless. Now, I appreciate tough. Sometimes that's necessary. But being without mercy, being ruthless, is, is not a characteristic that I'm willing to adopt. Um, that, to me, immediately was a red flag saying this is going the wrong way. Um, yeah, I remember uh, hearing a female Scientologist on the media once saying, we are a religion that does not turn the other cheek. Yeah. 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 We will smack you if you come anywhere near us. And it, that, I mean, those host of contradictions exist in all such, you know, when religion goes wrong. I mean, Eric Fromm said something like, you know, as long as who was an atheist, as long as you believe in a God that's loving, I have no argument with you. But once you believe in a vengeful, destructive force that you're going to unleash on the world, you are, by definition, antisocial. You're against the rest of society. And yeah. you know, like me, you've studied the history of religion. And, and so you, we, we see that, you know, the millenarian movements um, right. at the time of the Crusades, the movements in the, the Commonwealth in England in the 1640s, where you get people believing all sorts of very strange things and the origins of anarchy with um, the, the, the levelers at that time. But the way that belief was used to destroy people, to mm -hmm. say, you know, you are of the devil, you are possessed. You know, the whole, within the Protestant movement, the whole notion that the Pope was a devil, that, that yeah. all of this demonizing, all of this, you know, making an outgroup of other people, which ultimately leads to genocide, you know, in, in so many places and times where other people are not considered human. Right. You know, I think I've been reading, um, I don't know if you saw my lecture at the last ICSA conference that was online. And I, I, I talked about um, Ernest Becker's book, The Denial of Death, and how that impacts uh, the uh, uh, current view of cults that, that, that we have. Um, uh, Becker, of course, relied a lot on Otto Rank for his uh, uh, basis for the, the psychology behind why he did that. And anyway, to, to get to the point here, they, they call these things that we call religions and symbolic worldviews that we, we come up with, whether they're sciences or anything else, art, art movements, immortality projects. Yeah. And the reason for that is that that the human being, unlike other animals, lives in, in, in two dimensions. The creature self, which there's some higher creatures like ravens and elephants and uh, dolphins, you know, that, that yeah. seem to have some kind of language. Right. Mm -hmm. But th they don't separate that language from their creature self. It's part of their survival mechanism. The human being broke away from that somehow. And, and has another world, the symbolic world, that, that's a very important part of what they do. And they play with it, they create with it in order to make sense of the fact that we are going to die. Yeah. We're aware of death. And so we, we find strategies to overcome that. We develop reincarnation ideas. We develop Phaeton ideas, the soul, the eternal soul. Um, the, the, the theosophists used to call that the monad, taking yeah. off of Leibniz, the great, you know, he, yeah. he had this idea of the monad, which is an yeah. eternal construct in the universe that is part of all reality. I mean, the, and, uh, the original idea is that every particle in the universe is a living entity. That was the original 
Mind. Yes, yeah, corpuscle or whatever they used to use yeah. back in the day. But but the idea is that, that we create this in order to make meaning of this craziness between birth and death. Mm-hmm. And and we create the craziness is the problem. Mm-hmm. You know, we just can't flow. The animals seem to live godlike. Yeah. Bees, bees seem to know what to do. You know, they build these wonderful hives, hexagonical miracles, and and uh, and, and we have to go to school and struggle and and, and, and figure out how to do that, you know, with, with mathematical equations and, and all this stuff. So, so the immortality project is very important to us. As a result, we can be easily been manipulated by other people's confidence in what they say is an immortality project, mm. you know, because it's, it's a deep inner need in the human being to do that. So to me, it's not surprising that cults are around, that they've always been around, that they're going to be around because every generation has to struggle with the same idea it doesn't stop as long as there's human beings we continue to have to struggle to make sense of of this world and and rank to his credit says that you know these things are valuable they're necessary the the great religions are are good they're like they're called um contexts or collectives that we can put ourselves in if we don't like the collective anymore we become modernized you know then we see the illusions in it and therefore we write off Christianity, we write off Buddhism, we write off Hubbard and the Scientology, you know, we become modernized. Now we're stuck with becoming self-creative. In other words, we have to take the role of the artist where we have to self-create this immortality project over and over and over again because every time we finish a work, it dies and we got to start again and we got to start again. And this is the this is what Rank talks about in his book. This one here. Okay. Uh, and, and the subtitle is Creative Urge and, and Personality Development. And I, I read this and, and after all this time, I'm in my 70s, I figured out why I'm an artist. <laughs> <laughs> it's finally making sense. <laughs> and uh, so I, I got on this kick lately about, you know rank and and becker and then this book called the worm at the core there's a lot of talk lately you know in in my lecture with ixta i I bring up some of the people i discovered that are lately reviving becker and this idea of denial of death and why we repress things you know for instance they see the reason for the apocalyptic um uh, climate change movement you know we got to change we're going to save ourselves it falls right back into Becker's analysis of why we do this stuff. You know, we get crazy about these things because we don't want to die, you know, or we want to have a legacy that lives on. We want to hand it on to our children. And so we get easily manipulated by images of great change, like, you know, the the earth's going to burn up, you know, or that kind of thing. So whether or not climate change is real, and I do believe it's real, the, the scientists studying it are seeing people are crazy on both sides of this. You know, they're not, they're not in reality. They're, they're out there doing movements and chanting and, and, and changing things. And they're ignoring the science. They're ignoring the, the reality of, of, of what we can do by getting, you know, suddenly investing in green energy and stuff that's not going to work in the long run, like windmills and, and, and these, these crazy looking things, the, the solar collectors, eventually that's all going to be junk according to the science <laughs> Because, you know, as it looks, we're moving back to nuclear energy, you know, no, and, and nuclear is the, the, the clean version. And it gives us this terrible paradox between. Yes. Yeah, I mean, yeah, which nuclear is also when you think about the god Shiva in India, yeah. the god of creation, the god of death. Yeah. Oppenheimer quoted uh, something from the, you know. Of, I am become the, death. The yeah. Yes, that's Shiva. And so o- Oppenheimer knew instinctively what he was releasing here. Life and death is, is right there. It's happening in front of him. You know, as that explosion took place in, in, Los a- in uh, White Sands in New Mexico. Yeah. So, you know, th- this, this ability for cult leaders to manipulate us is a lot clearer for me how that happens. And, and it's just all the studies show that if you show people images and ideas about death before they make other decisions, you know, in these tests that that you you do, it changes the way you think, the proximal idea of death or or, or an immortality project. Like you go to a workshop that's like Landmark Corporation, you go to an introductory workshop, they right away tell you you're going to be transformed, you're going to become a better person, you're going to be better for the world. 
you know, and suddenly you have an immortality project in front of you. It's very compelling. And they want you to sign on and, and you feel drawn to it. Why? Well, because it's going to help you deal with your own death, you know, and how to live in the meantime. Mm-hmm. That's it's as simple as that, I think. And and, uh, and, you know, and, I, and I think that Hubbard was onto that very much, too. You know, he was trying to create an immortality project that made sense to him because he, he would not submit to authorities about his own mental derangement. You but, know, he didn't I mean, want there's a other 19... people diagnosing him, and so he diagnosed himself, right? Oh, there's a 1938 handwritten, sorry, a typed but signed letter um, from August 1938. Hubbard was writing to his first wife. Um, he, the, the letter starts, Dear Skipper, which was his nickname for her, the Skipper, the Captain. And in, in the letter, this is the year that he'd supposedly in February made his great dis- first great discovery and uh, written a book called Excalibur, um, which oh. was you know, opened all of these secrets and people had gone mad reading it you know, and this kind of propaganda nonsense. So some months, same year, a few months later, he says, my only goal is to smash my name into history. And he says he doesn't believe in immortality other than what is achieved by artists and, and authors. Um, Interesting. And it's a, it, it leaked out of Scientology. They've actually copyrighted it since then just to authenticate it for us. So that's the beginning for him that, that he has decided, he's modernized, he's decided that he's not going to survive. Then at the very end of his life, he leaves $648 million, all of it stolen from his followers. Um, none of it from his vast science fiction output or any, anywhere else, all from Scientology uh, and Scientologists. And 500 million of that goes to the Church of Spiritual Technology, which in its origins was set up to perpetuate the name L. Ron Hubbard. So mm-hmm. half a billion dollars to make sure that he'll be remembered. And it made me think about the the Romans and the Chinese both have systems where if your name is chanted, then you will continue to live. Yes. And mm-hmm. yeah, there's a, a poignant moment. That, that's in, exactly what Rank is talking about here. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a poignant moment in uh, Robert Graves' I, Claudius, where Livia, the, the wife of the first emperor, Augustus, pleads with Claudius, who she's told is going to become emperor, make me a god. You know, mm-hmm. have libations and all this. I think Hubbard was after that sort of thing. The other thought you stimulated, of course, Joseph Campbell in yeah. his great uh, Masks of God series talks about you know, primitive mythology, Occidental mythology, Oriental mythology, 500 pages each, and then the creative mythology. And he says that the, what we have to do is indeed embrace our creativity and that it is the artists among us who can lead us to a, you know, a, a better understanding of the eternal now, you know, this place where we are actually living rather than the eternal future, rather than some heaven or, you know, um, reincarnation or what have you. Right. And, and accepting, accepting the positivity of that. You know, I mean, I, I have absolutely no concern about my own death other than that it might upset some of my friends, you know. And I'm sorry about that. And it won't be deliberate on my part. You know? <laughs> but it, and, it, and you can. You can reconcile yourself with it. Um, you know, as Eric Erickson said, you, you, can, you can have immortality as a spiritual being. You can have it as a bunch of chemicals. You can have it through monuments. You can have it through ideas and works. And you can have it through your children. And yeah, you, can have it through le- you can have it through legacy. Yes, there's a legacy. It's exactly. what they're arguing. It's a, le- yeah. a legacy, you know, rather than going to a heaven, which is what the, the collective might offer you, mm-hmm. that you, you maintain your individuality in and, 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 and some kind of a heaven after death. Um, the legacy might be more important to some people. They don't care about the heaven. Yeah. You know, that, that kind of thing. Yeah. You know, it's interesting the, the existentialists uh, uh, were, were deeply invested in, in this modern concept that somehow the collective religion is exploding around us, you know, with the new sciences and everything. And we're starting to realize that maybe along with Buddha or whoever, that that, that stuff isn't even worth talking about. We have to deal with what's now. 
Yeah. And Camus, Camus came up with, you know, Robert Lifton's favorite author is Camus, yeah. so he's kind of an existentialist. Like Roger, yeah. Camus, Camus, yeah. Camus came up with this idea that in the myth of Sisyphus that we're all rolling this rock, the meaning is in the rock. It's not about the, the God that put you there to roll the rock. It's just that without that, you have no meaning. So dig in, you know, get up every day and push that rock, you know, mm -hmm. before you go to bed. The better you do it, the better your life is. And that, that's it. That, that's all there is. You know, that's, yeah, that's how you put it. The fundamental notion that there isn't a meaning or a purpose to be discovered in the universe. There just isn't a meaning or a purpose. But there might actually be something more than that, you mm -hmm. know, greater than that, which of which we're part. And yeah, I agree, agree with you. Camus is, is an inspiration. On the other hand, you've got Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir, who I yeah. think were dreadful people um, and, and made a meaningless universe. And Right, yeah. It, Camus was more humanistic. Exactly. And, yeah. and he had a sense of the absurd. He had a sense yeah. of humour, which is completely lacking in... You know, Sartre yeah, yeah. and de Beauvoir collaborated with the Nazis and then they co collaborated with Stalin. You know, let's get, oh, get real about yeah. that. But, um, yeah, well, fascinating territory. Um, well, this is the kind of stuff that gets people into cults, thinking about the things we're talking about right now. Yeah. Because this is the kind of, of, of stuff that they offer, you know, what is life all about? And, and so the, the, the questions have to be refined because the easy answers will get you into trouble. Yeah. And that's where the problem comes in. Yeah. And I, I, I've come to believe, I mean, I mean I've, traveled into uh, you know i became an atheist when i was 13 i because it didn't seem to me that the christian god i was being offered made any sense it seemed like a brute psychopath this character i was being offered who we were meant to love and you know anything that would want to be worshipped i wouldn't be willing to worship it's pretty simple that way because narcissism is not a good quality i much later on came came actually to a, a Sufi conception of God, which was uh, more acceptable to me, though I still don't believe in God, um, which was the idea that God created the universe to share his beauty. I quite okay. like that idea. Um, but I, you know, at 17, I became involved with Buddhism. I spent a few days in a, a Zen temple and learned meditation there and went through the usual confusions of adolescence. and. That, you know, so when I got to Scientology, I did not believe in God. I would just define myself as an agnostic because I don't believe we can ever know the first cause of the universe. So I'm, I sit with Darwin on that one. We're agnostics. Um, but I still believed in the, the notion of enlightenment. And that was right the way through Scientology. I, I have translated the Tao Te Ching because that was the first book that I saw, Lao Tzu's. And I've over the years read about 60 copies and tens of commentaries and gone through it character by character. Because as with the Buddha, you have somebody who's not saying, look, you've got to worship this to get there. The Buddha said, um, if the gods, gods were enlightened, they wouldn't be trapped in this right. universe. And Lao Tzu and Jiangsu both seem to be agnostic. They, they're saying, yeah. we don't know what the origin of the universe is, but it had an origin. Let's call it Tao. But that doesn't tell us anything about it, you know, and right. that exploration does seem valuable. But I probably, you know, I'm 65 now. It's probably about 10 years ago that I finally gave up on the idea of enlightenment. And so uh -huh. well, actually it wouldn't be relevant, you know, that what is relevant well, is... Well, you is know, I, I come to think that enlightenment is in, in the ephemeral state anyway. It's there and then it's gone. Yeah. So there is no permanent state for a human being because, you know, we all get up grumpy in the morning and you know what I mean. Yeah. And I, I came to, to sort of say, well, rather than having this serenity, this kind of adolescent idea that nothing will ever hurt me again, which I think is bound up in that idea that, uh, you know, nothing will make any. You have your feelings and mm -hmm. um, you grow up, you mature. And maturity means coming into relationship so that you, you know, when things go wrong for you, there are people to support you. And mm -hmm. I say this as someone for whom things went very wrong in terms of being attacked by Scientology and then being attacked by a group of my own friends who were ex-Scientologists and not practicing. Yeah. 
uh, which was very distressing. But it brought me to go, you know, my family, my friends, who are my adopted family, of course, how, how we relate to each other is, is, is what's important. And our maturity is, is in that, that, that we seek to, it, seek to do no harm, first do no harm, yeah. and from there seek to do something positive and ethically useful. I think, again, Eric Fromm in a book called Man for Himself says that the problem with psychology is it's divorced, it's, and psychotherapy, it's divorced itself from ethics. Hmm. And he looks back to Baruch Spinoza, as do I, as somebody who penetrated this notion of ethics and of goodness and of virtue and of and the understanding that the only benefit you're going to get from this is doing it. You, nobody's going to come along and give you a good karma vipaka because you, yeah. you were a good person. You can feel satisfied with yourself and hopefully not too smug, but satisfied with yourself because you've done what was right, you've done what was needed, and you've helped people, you've not turned your back on the world. Uh, at the other end, you have kind of complete self-sacrifice, which I think you and I have, have both probably come pretty close to, the point where we've taken on far more than we could deal with. Oh, yeah. And, and we're, you know, struggling to make ends meet. Um, but there was the necessity, the drive, which at times seems selfish. As, as you say, you know, you start accumulating books and trying to find out about the thing. It becomes addictive. It becomes obsessive. But there is always this sense that it's tremendously useful. I, when I came back to talk about Scientology after being silent from 1996, I started blogging at Tony Ortega's wonderful underground bunker with the realization mm. that most people who leave Scientology don't recover without some help. The, Conway and Siegelman pointed to this in Snapping and said, you know, it had the, the most, Scientology has the most debilitating set of rituals of any cult in America. And they estimated that it would take 12 and a half years without help to recover from Scientology. I wrote to them about six, seven years ago, and I said, um, that was a guess, wasn't it? Um, the, the reality is that without help, in my experience, which is, I've worked with about 600 ex-Scientologists over the years, um, it needs a little bit more. And it, what frustrated me, I had a guy who came to me and he'd been 20 years housebound because Hubbard had said he was a suppressive person and he didn't want to hurt anybody. 20 years locked in the house. It took one afternoon to, to get him out. And he went, went home, got a job and, and carried wow. on. And that made me furious. That thought that there are people out there who are the very best of people you know, who are trapped because of some deception from, from a group. And the thought that, you know, it doesn't take thousands and thousands of hours of intense counselling or auditing, as they call it, it generally takes a day. It generally takes, you know, it frustrates me that, uh, you know, I, I contacted Leah Remini when she started making noise as I read Troublemaker and I sent her a copy of A Piece of Blue Sky, I sent her a copy of my book, Opening Minds. Yeah. And I got two very nice handwritten letters back from her. But she says, you can take the girl out of Scientology, but you can't take Scientology out of the girl. And my point to her was that I'd be very happy, free of charge, to take Scientology out of the girl. But people don't do it. I think perhaps because of the sense of elitism that lingers from belonging to one of these exclusive groups, they don't see that humility is the most important human virtue. And right, you know, Conway and Se yeah, Conway and Siegelman. You brought them up, brought up this uh, concept, which became kind of a meme called information disease, yeah. which is what brainwashing, you know, in implicates uh, in, in the human mind is that you have a diseased way of thinking and, and then behaving as a result of that. So you know, critical thinking, a good skeptical orientation uh, can help get rid of the diseased information in, in a mind. And as long as that diseased information is governing you, it's going to govern you, you know, until you find a way to change it. Now, I, I've used this in a lecture when I was a kid fishing by a river, you know, maybe eight years old. And there was a, a, a toad jumping around and I went to pick it up. And one of the older boys there said, hey, don't pick that up. You're going to get warts, <laughs> you know. And, and so I, my hands went back and that stuck in my mind. I had thought that toads caused warts until I studied biology in high school 
and realized this is bullshit. Now, that meme is stuck in my mind, you know, controlling my behavior about these creatures. Yeah. Well, you know, you can expand that into all kinds of areas, mm -hmm. the way people pick up certain beliefs. And then they find out 20 years later, like you said, that, hell, that's not true. And here's the reason why it's not true. Mm -hmm. And suddenly the brain starts rearranging all kinds of neural nets in there to, to, to you, you feel like you're born again. You've been relieved of something. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's what happens. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you, you have a conversation with somebody or, or you read a significant book. I mean, my attempt at the bunker was to actually write down what people needed to know, because treating with people one by one, as I say, I've managed about 600 over the years, um, and it's not something I do anymore. Um, and Leslie Remini is watching and would like to pop over. Uh, I don't wear white socks. I've read that she doesn't like men to wear white socks. I'm very careful about that. I've never actually worn white socks, which... I'm guessing she wouldn't support the white socks thinking about that, you know, but mm. or a red socks sort of girl. <laughs> but um, I wanted to find a way of um, expressing these thoughts. And so for me with Scientology, it was saying, and, and, and with any group, you have to consider the dogma. Do you still believe it? Not, mm -hmm. you know, do you want to believe it? Not does somebody else think you ought to believe it, but does it make sense? If you look at Scientology, Hubbard tells us that it's fundamental that there is a triangle of affinity, a liking for something, reality, which is what is, uh, and communication. And these form understanding. And if you raise any one of the corners of this triangle, then you will raise all the others. And there is a very simple rebuttal of this. Hubbard said uh, that bullets, too, are a form of communication. So within this formulation, if you shoot somebody, you communicate more with them, they'll like you more. You know, that you, you know, it will increase their understanding of you. I agree to that. Yeah. You know? But that, you know, it has to, it depends on what the quality of the communication is. And once that formulation collapses, then the edifice built upon it begins to collapse. I mean, I right. had a conversation uh, seven years ago with a wonderful Australian woman who had left the group, having grown up in it, having gone through the sea organization. She'd left 16 years before. And I thought, well, you know, she'll be fine. And she wasn't because she had she was born into the group. What some people are calling second generation adults, which is SGAs. I don't like this. These kind of terms that, you know, become a loaded language almost. They, they become a secret special language. Born ins. It's good enough. People are born into these groups. But she said to me in our first conversation, is reality really agreement? because Hubbard taught that we are all of us agreeing to the universe being here, and that's why it's here. He, right. in, fact, in one lecture, says we're all chanting space particle position all the time. I mean, I've never noticed that I was doing that. But she said to me, is reality in agreement? And I said, if you're a hypnotist, yes. Uh, but otherwise, no, you, you're entitled to your own view of reality. The next week, when I talked mm. with her, she said that she'd used scented laundry conditioner in her washing. And we both knew what she was talking about, but we hadn't talked about it at all. And it's a prohibition in what is called the Sea Organization Hygiene Hat, the okay. training. Okay. Because Hubbard had a scent phobia, as of course did Rajneesh and probably various other people. Oh, yeah, no, I know that. He, he was allergic to perfumes. Yeah. And so and he believed that the psychiatrists who rule the universe are trying to take us all over by using rose perfume. He was very specific about this, but this is secret doctrine. This is not published anywhere. Now, she had, because she'd been in the sea organization, she had never had a scented soap, a scented shampoo, anything with scent in, and she'd now broken the rule. And we both knew what it meant. Once you've got somebody to look at what the belief trap they're in and be willing to question it, they'll do the rest. You know, you don't need to keep telling them what's wrong. But they yeah. do need to think about the dogma and whether they still believe it. And, you know, Scientologists put down the overt motivator sequence and they then believe in karma. And if you say to them, well, what have you read about the Lords of Karma in the Akashic Records? They say, what are you talking about? Yeah. What goes around comes around. You know, well, what evidence do you have for that? And how would the universe function if from the first thing that happened, everything was a reaction in Karma Vipaka? I mean... How did those 471 people all to come, come together on that plane? You're talking about a terrible kind of fatalistic 
determinism here that you can't change, you know, that mm. is overwhelming. Um, not quite the Buddhist idea of karma, but, you know, the Hindu idea, certainly. But they, the, the point is that they don't check. They just relabel the belief. So yeah. they, don't, they don't believe in past lives anymore. They believe in reincarnation now. But they don't know that Hindus and Buddhists call this the fear of the eternal return. They have the happy hippie view that they'll be able to do it in their next life, you know, rather than saying having a next life is a punishment. It's the wheel of suffering and all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So it's getting somebody to engage with their own beliefs to say, you know, I follow Jesus. That means I've got to give everything I have to the poor because that's what he said. And I'm poor. So if they want to send their things to me, that would be fine. <laughs> I don't care about the eye of the needle or the camel. They can keep them. Well, yeah, it, I, I think a lot of it is uh, what I call when I, when I have clients that ask me, you know, well, what do you think is the real religion? You know, and that's the wrong question. Yeah. You know, you don't ask questions like that because it'll get you into trouble. You'll find con artists that will answer it for you. Mm. And uh, so, you, you know, I try to explain to them that I'm not anti-religion. No, I mean, I'm not anti-atheist or, or whatever. I'm not an atheist. but um, I'm looking for the elegant expression of that particular, what Rank calls immortality project, that symbol world that they're creating. You know, you, you can look at Judaism, for instance, and there's some brilliant discussions in that, in that tradition about how we should relate to one another and, and, and all of that and refinements on, you know, what the name of God is and all and, and everything. And, uh, uh, and, and yet there's also some very constricting elements at one end of, of Judaism and in, in the strict Orthodox, which can be harmful, you know, to personal growth and, and, and women and, and whatever, you know, in terms of their personal growth. Yes. You know, so there's elegant aspects to these religions. And then there's these disastrous forms of them also going on, sometimes at the same time within the same auspices. Yes. You know, you know, I grew up Catholic. And so I, I, I. I had to deconstruct my own religion over time to see what it was about. And, uh, you know, sure, I, I can preserve some of the great teachings about the mysteries in it, which have incredible discourses that can enrich the way you feel and within a collective. So you share it with other people. That to me is beautiful. If that would float your boat, you know, if you don't want to be a rebellious artist and, and fine, you know, go there as long as you do what it says, love your enemies, you know, that kind of thing. Learn to do that along with it. Um, if you can go that far with it, then you've probably got a fairly healthy religion. Hmm. But, you know, if, if, if you're utterly modernized, then you're stuck with this thing that Rank's talking about, because he had a lot of clients that were artists, and he, you know, tried to figure this out for them, and that's why he wrote the book. Hmm. And uh, so I, I think that... Uh, uh, the, the, the ex-member, you know, since we're talking about this, that, that comes from a call, I find many of them will remain within a collective for a while because it does feel safe. Like, let's say they left a Christian cult, then they get into a wider collective of, say, a, a good evangelical church or maybe the Catholic church or whatever that yeah. has a nice community. And, and, you know, they don't care if you read the Satanic Bible one night and some other book the other night, as long as you don't try to sell it to the congregation, you know, mm -hmm. they're not going to condemn you for, for thinking in your own way, yeah. you know, so it's, so it's a lot of ex members and some ex members will call top, you know, they, they started in a new age group, you know, and, and they maybe find out that, that Ramtha is faking and all this stuff. And next thing I know, they're, they're involved in going to meetings with Mafu or, or some other entity, you know, so, um, the, the the system of belief hasn't been figured out yet and they get still trapped in that constrictive system of channeling or whatever it is. Um, hopefully they get into a more benign group that doesn't control their lives as much or doesn't make them as paranoid about the world, you know, but, but so, so I, I guess what I'm saying is that, that we're, we're kind of condemned like the existentialists would say to be free, but more along with rank, we, we, will create symbolic worlds because that's what we do that's separate from our creatureliness you know we, we didn't invent ourselves we don't create the reality of our heart beating 
you know, that, that new age adage, which you create your own reality. Well, 99% of what you do, you don't create, mm -hmm. you know, you, you don't create your breathing. If you had to do that, you'd die within 10 minutes. Yeah. You know, so uh, what we do create is a symbolic world and that's malleable. That moves around, that changes. And I think it changes basically through what I see reality as reality is, is, is relationship. It's a relationship with our environment with our ideas, with other people. Um, reality doesn't exist within. There's no such thing as a God within. There's no such thing as, as a, a self, and I agree with Buddhism here, that it exists independently of relationship. Wittgenstein would have said, there's no private language. Yeah. You have to share it for it to be real. Yes. If it's private, you're schizophrenic, you're, you're ill, there's something wrong with you. You, know, you could be enlightened in Iraq, you might as well be schizophrenic at that point because it's meaningless, totally meaningless because it has no relationship to the world in action, meaning karma. You're not working through karma properly and um, you can't avoid it. You, you know, it's, it's doing right action, not avoiding action that the Buddha was talking about. It's right yeah. action. Yeah. So, and, and karma means action, right? So basically that's how I see it now is that, the relationships with what I'm involved in, whether it's a book or a person or an interview here, is what makes reality for me. And the better that is, the better I am, the better it is for the environment and, and, and all of that. So that's, in a nutshell, what I've come to at, at, at this long journey. Yeah, it's, yeah which is fascinating. I mean, that um, Kant, who I've not read, and I'm not going to, but he allegedly... Immanuel I, Kant? Immanuel Kant. I don't want him to sue. Yes, okay. I want him to sue me, so allegedly... He said, you know, there is the world as it is, and there is the world as you experience it. And these are distinct things. And if you think about um, the, the occasional wolf children who have emerged, mm -hmm. where children who have not had any human contact come into human contact, cannot learn language, cannot mm -hmm. live in the abstract world of human beings, which shows that, that we are products of community, we're products of our relationship. But we do unlike a, you know, a leopard or a kangaroo, we have a symbolic world. And that symbolic world can persuade us that abstract things are true. So we hear politicians talking about how great we are and how great our country is and how rotten somebody else is. And moving up these very strange notions that, that are become fervent notions, become things that are so important to people that you get groups like QAnon coming yeah. out of the woodwork and and basically the most rapidly growing cult group in the world today and one that that could we could in a very short period of time be seeing terrible carnage as a consequence of a set of beliefs that really don't add together don't make sense are not rational but which have reached into the emotional depths of human beings and said, you can belong to this. You, you can, you know, you can make the world meaningful. Um, you know, you can have your immortality project by being part of this thing, which takes on the notion that Donald Trump is the savior, and yeah. um, which, which is an idea I find very hard to, to understand. I must say, um, but, but you know, you're bringing up a good point. I, I think the mistake that QAnon makes and that kind of thinking is that. There's, there's no, um, since, since everything's illusion, hmm. it's all Maya. You know, you hear this yeah. from people that are invested in, in, in finding out about reality when they're adolescents. You know, it's all illusion anyway. We just make shit up, which is true to a certain point. But then how good is it that you're making? This is the point. Hmm. You know, how, how does it reality test? Hmm. You know, it's, it's one thing to say that, like Gurdjieff, who was one of these fake teachers of old and influenced quite a few people. Yeah. The story about him was that he could concentrate so much mental energy that he could kill a yak at a thousand yards. You know, well, that's an overvalued that. belief. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah th th that's an overvalued belief. There's no way to reality test that, you know, and, and, and if you did, he would fail every time. So, you know, you, you, you can create your own reality and create a fantasy world and all this, but there is such a thing as mental illness. Yes. You know, there is such a thing as social illness. Mm. Those are real concepts. Yeah. We, don't, we don't just make them up. They, they work in relationship. 
And the problem with QAnon is it breaks down the reality base of relationships. It's in this virtual world of, 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 of you know, people um, uh, drifting from one thing to another. You know, if somebody sets off an explosion here, they all pay attention to that and they move around in that universe, mm -hmm. you know, and, and uh, combine and recombine things that, that have no, um, no guiding narrative voice. You know, like no J.K. Rowling writing Harry Potter, infusing some kind of morality story within her mm. her uh, fantasy world. There's nothing like that in QAnon. No, that's and, the problem with it. And people start to live in interpretation instead of in perception. Right. And you know, we we have the the anti-science movement, which is so powerful now. Yeah. And I understand the the hubris and the arrogance with which some scientists have presented their views. I understand that we've seen, because science should not be a belief system, but often those within it put it forward as a belief system, that science is something that should be malleable, that better information can lead us to better places. But we still see some very bad science. Oh, yeah. um, you know, for example, when uh, in the 1963, I think it was the first time that, that the corpus callosum was cut in, a, in a, an epileptic and they stopped having seizures. So the connecting fibers between the two hemispheres of the brain meant they stopped having seizures. Then we got the idea that there are two separate cells in the head. This is perpetuated. You still hear it. Well, oh, yeah. yes, if you cut the corpus callosum, you have because there's no direct communication between the hemispheres. But in a normal brain, it's integrated. So, it's an integrated whole. Yeah. Remember the book Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain? I do, yeah. <laughs> I gave it to my mum about 25 years ago. <laughs> yeah, and you know, it's, it's it's based on a false premise, but it sold, right? Yeah, and, and how. You know, yeah. Didn't create a great raft of new artists, sadly. And I think the no. Victorian method of teaching, drawing by starting with a line and a squared grid and working up to shade and cast black and white and then to colour in three dimensions, which I accidentally followed myself as a teenager, that's a much better way of teaching drawing. But oh, yeah. um, so it goes. I'd very much like to have more conversations because I'm intrigued by your thinking. We, we've travelled the same, many of the mm -hmm. same paths. Anyway, the main emphasis is a new book. Right. Santa Fe, Bill Tate and me. Um, how an artist became a cult interventionist. Um, you found out what a fascinating and well-informed man the author is. And uh, so rush out and buy 15 copies straight away <laughs> and um, create a chain, a flood of this book through the world. Um, it's very helpful. And, and I think for, for anybody who's been involved in any sort of authoritarian group or even authoritarian relationship, an abusive relationship, it's very useful to find parallels in other groups and to realize that what we're dealing with is just being a normal human being underneath all of this, that, that we all, um, with the rare exception of, of certain people who have disorders like psychopathy, and narcissism, we're all of us pretty much acting in the same way and are influenced by the same thing. So um, excellent book. Thank you very much for your time, Joe, and uh, we'll talk again. Hi, John here. Thanks for watching. We'd appreciate it very much if you would click like, as well as subscribe, and click the bell for notifications. Every dollar helps, and we welcome new patrons on Patreon. Or you can make a one-off payment with any currency through PayPal. Thanks so much. I'm poor. So if they want to send their things to me, that would be fine. <laughs>